uh, what's on our agenda today? So first I'll share with you just in case that you haven't uh, uh, that or, or maybe you just heard about DP600, but not sure what is it all about. So then we will cover skills that are measured by this exam. And then we will dive into our main part of the session, which is some core concepts and features that you need to learn in order to be able to successfully pass, the ex pass this exam. Finally, uh, uh, as I promised, I'll share some learning resources with you. So where to go from here from this session? And of course, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or uh, after the session is finished, I'll, I'll uh, stay to try to answer if I know the answers. If not, then I'll promise I'll get back to you offline then. So let's start with our first topic. What is DP600? Uh, and uh, Microsoft released this new certification. So Fabric as a product is fairly new. It was introduced like a year ago uh, and it, it is generally available since November. So it's been around for seven months. And this exam was introduced in January this year uh, as a successor of DP500 exam that maybe some of you took, maybe not, which was co which was called Azure Enterprise Data Analyst. So this one, uh, this one expands on the on the previous one, introduces some new concepts, new topics that are relevant for work with Microsoft Fabric. And to get this, this certification, you need to pass just one exam. And this exam is DP600, which is the, uh, uh, officially called Implementing Analytic Solutions Using Microsoft Fabric. So if your uh, position or you plan to work uh, in this position, something that is between data analysis and data engineering, then this certification and this exam uh, is for you. So what is the profile of candidate? I took this from Microsoft's official page and adopt it a little bit. So some of the responsibilities that are included for someone who plans to work as an analytics engineer, uh, you can see on the screen. I don't need to, to read through slides because I, uh, I'll share with Mark and the other guys. I'll share with the presentation afterwards. So some of the main responsibilities of someone who works as an uh, analytics engineer are, are listed here. And these professionals can assist in different tasks within the organization. And finally, for you as someone who plans to take DP600 exam, these are some skills, some core skills that you need to have under your belt uh, if you plan to successfully pass the exam. So here I will spend like a minute just to, to walk through because I think it's really broad set of skills and uh, I really passed like many Microsoft exams and this one covers for sure uh, uh, the broadest set of skills when it comes to data uh, uh, data related uh, exams that Microsoft created. So first of all, you need to have advanced Power BI skills. So it's not enough that you know the basics of Power BI. This one will really test you on some advanced concepts and some advanced uh, techniques. Uh, when we talk about Power BI, then it's necessary to know Power Query and DAX as uh, uh, integral part of, of Power BI. But when we go outside of this uh, wonderful world of Power BI, we also have some other things and concepts to, to keep in mind. Uh, you should be familiar, I wouldn't say proficient, but you should be at least familiar with T-SQL and PySpark because uh, two main workloads in uh, Microsoft Fabric are Lakehouse and Warehouse. So you need to know how to leverage both of them. Therefore, you should know uh, uh, T-SQL and PySpark and also data modeling concepts in general. We'll talk in more detail uh, uh, what goes under data modeling umbrella from the DP600 perspective, but keep in mind that data modeling is also something that you will be extensively tested on. <clears throat> Who are analytic, analytics engineers? Uh, this term was coined by DBT as far as I know. Uh, if you ask me, it's a kind of traditional BI engineer or BI developer. So a person who used to uh, connect to different data sources, extract data from those sources, transform them. So prepare a, a, a data model and finally 
this model will then be consumed downstream by data analysts or business analysts. So in this role as a fabric analytics engineer, you will probably find yourself surrounded by different data professionals, different data personas. So I think I listed at, at, at least as many as I could uh, uh, remember. So people like solution architects, data engineers, data scientists, uh, AI engineers, database administrators, Power BI data analysts, those are some of the roles which uh, uh, which will which will uh, collaborate tightly with uh, you as a fabric analytics engineer. When it comes to skills that are measured by this exam uh, and skills that you need to know to have uh, in order to to get the certificate, uh, again from Microsoft's official website, planning, implementing, and managing solution takes small smallest portion of this exam. It's 10 to 15 percent officially, so you can expect just a few questions coming from uh, from this area. Prepare and serve data. This is the biggest one. So almost half of the questions that you uh, get in the exam comes from this one. Also, implementing and managing semantic models is uh, relatively bigger, 20 to 25 percent. The same goes for exploring and analyzing data. Since we are a little bit limited with time, and when I say limited, this is a huge hiker's guide. Uh, we have like one hour to cover as much as possible. I decided to skip this first part that takes just 10% of the exam and focus on explaining concepts and features that are relevant for remaining part uh, uh, of the exam, because in reality, those three will probably sum up somewhere to close to 90%. So if you do this, uh, uh, properly, you will pass the exam. By the way, you need 70% of correct answers to, to pass the exam. And when I said that this is one of the broadest, uh, broadest uh, 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 exams that Microsoft ever created, uh, it's not my opinion, my personal opinion, so I need to support this with some facts, with some numbers. And there are totally 57 skills that are measured by DP600. Uh, to put this into proper context, in DP500, which was also like considered a broad exam, there were 48 skills measured. So now we have 20% on top of that. So 57 different skills are measured in DP600. So what we are going to cover today, uh, as you maybe know if you worked with Fabric, and I sincerely hope that you, even if you haven't had an opportunity to work with Fabric in real life, that you uh, 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 just uh, that you that you heard about it and you know some core components and uh, some high-level things and facts about Microsoft Fabric. So there are four main experiences in uh, in uh, in Microsoft Fabric. Uh, Four main experiences that are relevant for the for the content of the exam. Sorry, just to be clear. So there are more than that, uh, and four uh, four experiences that are covered by this exam are data engineering, data warehousing, data factory, and Power BI. So what we are going to cover today, as I mentioned, those three huge uh, uh, areas of uh, interest for passing this exam: preparing and serving the data implementing and managing semantic models and exploring and analyzing data. So what are the core concepts and features that you need to learn? Uh, this will take a, a while. So usually when people talk about core concepts and features, they list this uh, or everything in like maybe, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, but uh, there, there are more than that. So for, for DP600, there are more than that. So before I share with you some core concepts and features that you need to learn. Let's understand from a high level perspective what are different players in Microsoft Fabric, different components and how they relate to each other and which of them are included in the exam. So one lake, that's the central repository for storing uh, all the organizational data. So you can think of one lake. Microsoft branded it as one drive for your data, so you can think of it as one drive that you uh, that you use for your personal data. One lake is the equivalent for organizational data. So all of your data will be stored in one lake. This is the storage layer, and then we have compute layer on top of it, 
which consists of different engines, different experiences for processing the data. Uh, as you see in this uh, in this illustration, we have three, six, seven uh, different players uh, for data processing. Three of them uh, belong to Microsoft Synapse umbrella, data engineering, data warehouse, and data science. Real-time analytics was up until recently also the fourth pillar of Microsoft Synapse part of Fabric, but after build, Microsoft moved it as a separate workload, and it's called now real-time intelligence. Uh, there is also Power BI, well-known Power BI from uh, uh, previously before Fabric, Data Factory, which is a successor of Azure Data Factory, and you also have a brand new workload which is called Data Activator. This one is the only part of uh, the platform, of the Fabric platform, which is still in public preview. So Data Activator is still in public preview, and it will be soon merged under real-time intelligence workflow. So soon you will see Data Activator under real-time intelligence. Uh, from the perspective of taking DP600 exam, those three are out of the scope. So you will not be tested on data science, real-time intelligence, and Data Activator things. As of today, I don't know if Microsoft change will change something in the future, but as of today, you are not going to be tested on these three. So if you learn specifically for passing DP 600 exam, you can simply skip those three. Let's start with our first and biggest topic, and that's preparing and serving the data. Uh, when we talk about preparing the data, one of the key concepts to understand is called uh, Extract, Transform and Load, or ETL abbreviated. And for all of you who used to work with uh, data, work, used to work with data uh, uh, before Fabric, so ETL is not something that is exclusively rel relevant for Microsoft Fabric. That's a concept that exists for a few decades, I would say. Uh, 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 now, and uh, uh, it focuses on the process of extracting and, uh, as its name suggests, extracting the data from different data sources, transforming it and loading it into a central repository storage. So let's see what are the different stages that exist in this process. So in uh, extract step, we connect to a data source and we choose the data that we need to, to extract from that source. Then depending uh, if you go with this ETL approach where transforming comes uh, uh, straight after extracting, uh, in this step you will transform this data that's being extracted from the data source. So during the process of extra extraction you already apply some transformation steps to clean the data, uh, change data types, uh, combine the data coming from different sources and so on. Lately, in the last few years, uh, there is also a variation of this process, which is called ELT, Extract, Load and Transform. This is slightly, uh, uh, it, it, it changes the, the order of steps slightly. So don't be baffled if you, if you see this approach ELT in reality. Uh, this means that you bring the data as it is, so the, the, from the data source, without any transformation supplied on the fly. So you bring the data as it is in Microsoft Fabric, and then after you bring it into Fabric and store into Fabric, then you perform uh, different types of transformations that we are going to examine in the next few minutes. And finally, in this ETL, final step is to load this data, usually into fact and dimension tables for downstream consumption. Uh, we'll talk also about fact and dimension tables very soon. Finally, once you did all the things that are relevant for ETL process. Uh, the final step is to do some post load optimizations uh, to apply some performance tuning options and uh, implement different uh, uh, fine tuning techniques. When it comes to data loading process, we can choose between two main approaches. Uh, the first one is full loading of the data. Uh, this process uh, is relevant when you are loading, when you are populating your data warehouse or data lake house for the first time. How it works? You truncate all the tables and you reload full, full tables. There are some downsides to this approach. There are some benefits, of course, but let's start with downsides. First, uh, 
you don't store any history. So all old data, uh, uh, the entire old data is being uh, lost because you simply truncate everything you have uh, in your in your staging tables and you start from from scratch basically. And as I said, this one is a recommended way for some initial loads and and uh, uh, or when you need a full refresh of data that is already been that that's already been loaded into a warehouse. Incremental loading is uh, much more often used in analytical workloads. That's the process of updating the data uh, in warehouse or layhouse with changes since the last update. In this case, history is preserved and tables are just updated with new information. Uh, the main benefit is that it takes less time than the initial load, the initial full load, but the implementation is more complex than the initial load. Uh, with the initial load or full load, you just simply truncate the table and bring uh, another version of that table. With incremental loading, you need to implement some logic for checking which rows, which records were changed on your data source side before loading the data. And as I said, this approach is commonly used for regular updates to, to data warehouse or data lakehouse, such as daily or hourly updates, and it requires mechanisms to uh, track change, changes in the source data since the previous load. So what are our options for bringing the data into Microsoft Fabric? Uh, I'll focus on those that are uh, included in DP600. Of course, you have the option, for example, to simply upload files from some storage location to upload files in Microsoft Fabric. But since this is not part of DP600, I'll not, I'm not going to cover this. So first of all, we have data flows Gen 2. Data flows for all of you who come from a Power BI background. You're already familiar with Power Query, uh, and you're probably already familiar with data flows. Now it's gen, called Gen 1, or just data flows. Uh, this is a, a low-code, no-code solution for uh, bringing data from various data sources uh, into Fabric. The main difference between data flows Gen 2 and data flows Gen 1 is that now you can also add a data destination. So previously with data flows, we connect to a data source. Uh, we pull out some tables, we perform all kinds of transformations using Power Query Editor, and then we are done. So we save this data flow as a table within Power BI service. Data flows Gen 2 on top of it offers you a possibility to choose a data destination. And this data destination can be a Fabric Lakehouse, Fabric Warehouse, Azure SQL database or uh, Custo database for real-time analytics. In this case, we are mostly concerned about Lakehouse and Warehouse. So how this process of ingesting and transforming data with Power Query works in real life, you connect to a data source. Think of it as in this example you see on the right-hand side, uh, CSV file, for example. Uh, then you can transform the data uh, change column types, uh, add additional columns, and so on. Uh, and then finally, you you choose a destination. Uh, I apologize, this slide is not updated because Azure Synapse Analytics is not uh, available uh, as as a data destination anymore. So this was changed. Forget this. So just first for Lakehouse, Warehouse, Azure SQL Database, and uh, Custo Database or uh, uh, Real Time Analytics. So that's how you work with uh, with data flows. For everyone coming uh, uh, with a power back background, this you, you will find yourself in very familiar environment. Some of the pros and cons of using data flows Gen 2 for uh, ingesting data into Fabric. Uh, let's start with some advantages, some pros. Uh, Self-service users, they will be very happy uh, because they will probably uh, find this user interface familiar and well known. Optimizing performance, so you extract data just once, you load it into Fabric uh, uh, Lakehouse or Warehouse, and then from there, uh, this data can be reused multiple times. Uh, they can also reduce complexity because you can expose data flows to larger analyst groups and uh, ensuring data consistency and data quality. Role level security is still not supported, and you need 
fabric capacity workspace for data flows gen 2 so don't forget this uh, for regular data flows old ones you don't need fabric for data flows gen 2 you need fabric capacity next option for data ingestion uh, are fabric notebooks uh, this is one of the most powerful uh, features uh, uh, that exist currently in fabric and unlike manual uploads notebooks provide automation and ensure a smooth and systematic approach to data ingestion uh, uh, process data flows gen 2 they offer you a ui experience so low code no code experience whereas notebooks are code first approach so this is for people who are proficient with one of many different programming languages uh, you may see in the first uh, bullet point here uh, that you can write your code in uh, uh, four different languages, PySpark, Scala, R, or Spark SQL. So you can leverage any of those languages within a notebooks. You can also enrich your notebooks with markdowns, markdowns and comments and stuff like that. And this one is great because it also supports automation. So you can schedule uh, uh, jobs, Spark jobs and uh, execute notebooks at a certain point, uh, a certain point in time. With notebooks, you can easily connect to different uh, external data sources. Uh, then shortcuts are not an option. So shortcuts, just because I mentioned them, just a quick intro, what are shortcuts? So shortcuts uh, is the virtual uh, representation of the data that is stored somewhere else. So same as shortcut in your, on your file system in Windows, you create a shortcut on your desktop that points to a file which is stored on your C drive. So your physical data is stored in a file on C drive, but this is just a virtual representation of this data on your desktop. It's similar with shortcuts. You can create shortcuts to other internal locations within Fabric, so other lake houses, but also to some external data sources uh, like Dataverse or Amazon S3, uh, Azure Data Lake Storage, and so on. So shortcuts are preferred option when you don't want to replicate your data physically. But shortcuts, as I mentioned, are not supported for all data sources. And in those circumstances, when shortcuts are not supported, you can leverage notebooks to programmatically connect to these data sources and bring data from, from external source. Once you connect to data, you probably want to write it somewhere, to save it somewhere in your lake house. And uh, in this case, there are multiple options to choose from. Uh, first one is to write to a parquet file. Uh, so those are some examples on the right hand side. Those are some examples uh, how you can write your data to a parquet file. This one shows how to write to a delta format. Don't be confused between this difference uh, 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 with this difference between parquet and delta. So parquet essentially is the file format and Delta adds additional layer on top of Parquet files, and that, that additional layer provides storing log uh, transaction information. So all the things that you apply on files uh, uh, in terms of changing data, inserting new data, updating data, deleting data, this is stored in this transaction log, which is called Delta log. So Delta is essentially Parquet on steroids. That's how I like to think about that. Uh, Delta is format of choice in Microsoft Fabric. So uh, all workloads uh, and all the engines are built in that way so they can easily read data that, that is written in Delta tables. Uh, all engines in Microsoft Fabric, when you write data into Fabric, so nevertheless, if you're using notebooks or data flows Gen 2 or pipelines or whatever you use in Fabric to write the data, in Fabric, it will by uh, uh, by default apply this V ordering. This is a special algorithm that Microsoft invented to additionally uh, uh, optimize uh, uh, data sorting, so that later when you use, for example, Power BI to read this data, or uh, SQL Data Warehouse or Lake House, then data reading operations are much more performant and faster. If you're a T-SQL person like myself, so I don't know Python, uh, 
I, fair, I, I very rarely use uh, uh, notebooks, to be honest. So if you're a T-SQL person, you are not alone. You have different options in Fabric to uh, ingest the data using T-SQL. The most straightforward one is using copy statement. Copy statement uh, is very fast. It provides a high throughput, uh, but the main dis main downside is that it it's limited to just external Azure storage account. So nothing else can be used as a data source with uh, copy uh, copy statement. Uh, also, these uh, these statements will look familiar if you ever worked with SQL. So you can combine data coming from different places in Microsoft Fabric. Let's say that you want to merge data that is stored between different lake houses or warehouses. You can write cross database queries with three part naming. So your warehouse or lake house schema name, table name, and then you can join tables between different different uh, lake houses and warehouses. Select into create table and select so all of these commands are supported uh, for loading data in Fabric. And then we have a third option. So we had or no, it's fourth option. Sorry. So we had notebooks, we had data flows gen 2, we had T-SQL and now we have Fabric pipelines. Fabric pipelines are part of data factory experience. And maybe if you used to work with Azure Data Factory, or with Synapse, like with Synapse pipelines, this one will look very familiar to you. So Fabric pipelines are the tool for orchestrating the data. You can copy the data and ingest it into Microsoft Fabric, but uh, the, the, the purpose of pipelines also extends beyond that because you can orchestrate different activities as part of your pipeline. In this example that you see on your screen, I have three different tasks that are being executed in the sequence. So when this delete data task completes successfully, my data flow will be executed. And then after my data flow completes, my notebook will be will be uh, 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 run. You can parameterize uh, pipelines uh, and you can schedule pipeline runs on a specific schedule. So uh, those are things that are supported with Fabric pipelines. Common activities and one that you will probably most often use when you when you work with pipelines is copy data. Uh, you can use copy data tool or copy data assistant, which essentially enables you to connect to uh, a whole range of different data sources and then through uh, a very user friendly interface, you can define uh, which data you want to to move to copy to to your data destination. In this case, we are talking about fabric as our destination. And in this uh, pipeline canvas, you can set different properties and configure the pipeline execution. Shortcuts, I already mentioned them, so think of them as uh, Windows uh, shortcuts that we have in our file explorer on Windows. Currently, you can create uh, one lake shortcuts to one internal uh, uh, location. That's one lake. Uh, and also to uh, uh, the fourth external is missing because it was recently added. So external locations are ADLS Gen 2, Amazon S3, Dataverse, and also Google Cloud Platform. So those four are currently supported for shortcuts. And this is like a uh, simplified illustration why shortcuts can be uh, of great usage, of great help when working with Microsoft Fabric. So essentially you can uh, share the data between different domains, between different departments in your organization and uh, without physically moving data between those domains. So it's just a virtual representation of the data. These are some of the benefits of using shortcuts. Uh, so uh, really one of, if you ask me one of top three features in Fabric, in, in, uh, in the entire Fabric platform, uh, one of the top three features are shortcuts. Now we are moving to part which is related to organizing the data in Fabric Lakehouse. And uh, you probably heard, at least I hope you heard about the concept of medallion architecture. Uh, this is the term that was uh, introduced by Databricks 
and then all other vendors, including Microsoft, uh, acquire this uh, naming naming convention of three different layers that exist in uh, in the lake house uh, workloads. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to call them bronze, silver, and gold. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have exactly three different layers. You can have less than three. You can have more than three. You can name them however you want. But in this case, let's focus on these mainstream uh, 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 conventions. And because that's something that also Microsoft is using in the exam, so I don't want to confuse you too much. But essentially, you can think in terms of how data quality is changing between these three layers as raw data. That is one that we store in bronze layer. Then we have a validated data, which we store in silver layer. And finally, we have enriched or curated data that we store in gold layer. Let's spend some time trying to explain those those three layers and uh, which type of data and what data model you should apply in each of them. So bronze layer is the one that uh, where we land data from external uh, sources in its original raw state. So data is ingested as is containing only metadata in addition. Uh, the purpose, the main purpose of bronze layer is to uh, serve as a repository for historical uh, archive of source data and enable quick data reprocessing if needed without the need to connect again from scratch to the original data source uh, uh, external data source it's important to keep in mind that uh, bronze layer is uh, sorry. it contains unvalidated data that means this data can contain errors missing values and stuff like that and usually we store the data not only in parquet delta that would be preferable but very often this data comes in the form of csv files json files or some other uh, raw formats then we have the next level of quality in terms of uh, uh, of, of the, uh, uh, next level in terms of data quality is called silver layer where we have data from the bronze layer that is additionally conformed and cleaned so that all key business entities all the concepts and transactions are available in the form of an enterprise view uh, for ad hoc analysis and machine learning workloads this one so silver layer contains enriched and validated data that's the difference compared to a bronze layer and from a data modeling perspective data is usually modeled in that way so that uh, it's normalized to a third normal, normal form. So it reminds of relational, traditional relational uh, database management systems. And finally, uh, in this layer, you should already store your data in some structured way. So either parquet or preferably in Delta. And finally, we have this gold layer, which represents the icing on the cake, where data is structured and organized to support specific uh, uh, project requirements. Since this is the final stage in the process, data is additionally refined and cleaned. And in the gold layer, we also apply uh, various complex business rules and logic, uh, use case specific calculations, and so on. From the data modeling perspective, unlike silver layer, which is normalized to a third normal form, uh, the, here data is denormalized and usually implemented through a Kimball style star schema. We'll talk about star schema very, very soon. In terms of storage, similar to previous uh, uh, two layers, data should be stored in Delta so that all downstream uh, uh, workloads can consume it directly from there. Alternatively in Parquet, but as I said, you should strive to uh, store the data in Delta format. How do you organize uh, the data in your fabric well, uh, lake house? Uh, moving data across these medallion layers uh, 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 requires some work, requires some planning. And within fabrics lake house, that's, there's more than one way to move data between layers. Remember notebooks, data flows, pipelines, SQL, and so on. So how do you, how do you ensure that you choose 
the proper method for uh, moving your data. Few things to consider when deciding how to move is how much data are you working with? How complex are the transformations you need to make? Uh, how often, uh, how frequently your data will be moving between the layers? And of course, what tools are you most comfortable with? This one will should probably go uh, at the very top because yeah, if you don't know Python, you will probably not use notebooks, no matter how powerful they are. And one important thing to remember from perspective of uh, moving data within the fabric, data flows transform the data, so they transform the data. You cannot orchestrate data within the data flow. It just connects and transforms the data. Pipelines may be used for data orchestration, so you can implement multiple different steps in logical flow uh, to orchestrate the order of execution. And notebooks can do both, so they can be used for transforming data, but also for data orchestration. How do we implement medallion architecture in spe specifically in Fabric? So in bronze layer, as you mentioned, we ingest raw data. For that purpose, we can use pipelines, we can use data flows, we can use notebooks. Depending on uh, uh, your skill set and those things that we mentioned on previous slides, so how much data do you have and so on. Then in silver layer, we cleanse and validate our data. And for this one, we use data flows or notebooks. They can be orchestrated with pipe, within pipelines, but pipeline itself is not being used for data transformation. So it's just for copying data from somewhere. And finally, gold layer adds uh, more transformations and implement data modeling, dimensional modeling, and uh, it's exposed through SQL analytics endpoint or semantic model in Power BI. Some of the key uh, terms, key concepts to learn about dimensional modeling, fact tables uh, are the tables that store data about certain events. So something that happened at certain point in time, at certain location, uh, and uh, uh, so that can be transaction on POS terminal in uh, in your supermarket. That can be an information about uh, uh, the temperature for today in Salzburg, for example. That's an event. That's a fact. Uh, so we store measurable information within fact tables, and then we have dimension tables that uh, that are kind of a lookup table where we can connect this information for fact table and get descriptive information about certain event. So for example, uh, 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 if you talk about POS transactions at supermarket, who bought something? So what, who, is the, who is the customer that, that uh, uh, performed transaction? Uh, which products were included in that transaction? Uh, what is the date and time of this transaction? And so on and so on. So they provide like a descriptive, a list of attributes for every single event. In terms of dimensional modeling, few things to keep in mind and few uh, terms that you should be aware of and familiar with uh, regard, uh, when it comes to DP600. Keys. We talk about two different types of keys in dimensional modeling. We have a surrogate key, which is an artificial key built by your data warehousing system. And we have alternate key, which is a business key, and that is usually a primary key from your source system. So those are main things to keep in mind when it comes to dimensional modeling. Dimensional modeling is not a star schema only. So even though you will find in documentation that star schema is preferred way of doing things, and that is true, but there are other concepts that are relevant for dimensional modeling. So one of them is called snowflake schema where essentially you further denormalize dimension tables. You have more granular dimensions in your data model. Some other important concepts to learn about dimension tables, uh, calendar dimensions. So uh, this one should be part of every single semantic model, calendar dimension, uh, and slowly changing dimensions that store information about uh, different changes that happen to attributes within our dimension. Uh, they're especially useful for analyzing changes over time. Why? 
because let's say that you have a customer dimension and that your customer, uh, for example, changed their address and relocated from uh, uh, from California to uh, New York. So if you just simply overwrite this information and you do historical analysis on the state level, you will not get uh, uh, accurate information because the customer used to live maybe two years ago in California. Now it will be displayed as it lives in New York and all her or his uh, 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 sales will be transferred to New York as a state. That's why it is important to think about implementing changes to your dimension tables. Uh, there are, I think, six different types of slowly changing dimensions, even though uh, uh, most commonly used one is slowly changing dimension type two, where essentially you just add a new row for every single change to your, uh, to your attribute. Other concepts and features to learn in this part of the skills measured area, so prepare, uh, preparing and serving the data, from data modeling and data transformation perspective, you need to know about bridge tables. So when they are used and why they are useful. Denormalization as uh, the process, which is uh, the opposite of normalization in traditional relational database management systems. Concepts of merging and joining the data and different data cleansing techniques that you can apply using Power Query Editor in data flows or uh, using T-SQL or using notebooks. From performance optimization perspective, uh, you need to know how to identify bottlenecks in your data workloads and how to resolve performance issues. I suggest you take a look at query folding concept. This is the one that is most commonly responsible for uh, performance bottlenecks in Power Query transformations. And if you learn about query folding, you will also learn how to resolve these uh, bottlenecks in Power Query. Next subtopic is uh, related to implementing and managing semantic models. Uh, here, the most important concept to understand is called direct lake. That's something which is brand new in, uh, uh, in the era of Microsoft Fabric. So we didn't have direct lake before Microsoft Fabric. And that's why I call it revolutionary feature because it's brand new and it really solves many challenges that we had previously before Fabric uh, uh, introduced Direct Lake for Power BI. Some of the prerequisites for using Direct Lake and please be uh, uh, be attentive now uh, to what will I what I'm going I'm going to say because uh, in your case studies in DP600, so of course I cannot. Uh, disclose what's in those case studies, but there will be some nuances how and when to use Direct Lake, and you need to be 100% sure what are the prerequisites for using Direct Lake. First of all, you need fabric capacity, no matter the size of fabric capacity. So the smallest one, F2, also ensures that you can also provides Direct Lake feature, or Power BI Premium, that's PSQs. So Power BI Premium or Fabric Capacity. Then you need a lake house and, or warehouse or both of them in Microsoft Fabric. Delta format, so tables must be in Delta format. If it's not stored as Delta, no direct lake is possible. And reordering is not a hard requirement. I, there, therefore, I put this small asterisk. We, without reordering, direct lake will still work, but then probably performance will not be the most optimal one because of this additional uh, uh, optimization technique that I already explained. So why Direct Lake is such a big deal and why it is considered a, a huge improvement in, uh, in, in, in Microsoft Fabric? Before Fabric, we had two options. We had import mode where essentially we create a copy of the data. So we connect to our data source. We bring this data into uh, into Power BI Azure Analysis Services instance. So this is the cube. So essentially that's the copy of the data that we had in the data source. And all DAX queries that are generated from Power BI report are targeting and querying this copy of the data, this snapshot of the data that we stored in Power BI locally. Of course, the main benefit is super fast performance because uh, 
this data here is stored in memory, in RAM memory, and that's why it is super fast to retrieve the data from RAM memory. But two main downsides were data duplication, because essentially we are creating just a copy of the data that already exists somewhere else, and data latency. Because don't forget, in order to have the latest data available here, we need to go and refresh this, do this ref data refresh from time to time. So depending on how frequently you refresh your data here, you may have latency because there are new records coming in the original data source. Until you do the refresh here, they are not they are not available within the within the Power BI. And direct query managed to solve those shortcomings. So what happens with direct query? No physical data is stored in Power BI. For every single query that is generated from Power BI report, this query is translated to SQL, and this SQL query uh, is executed on the data source side. So data is being retrieved at the query time from the original data source. And that's great because there is no data duplication. We don't bring any data into Power BI. There is no data latency, meaning whatever is the latest record here in your original data source, this one at the query time will be picked up and shown in Power BI report. But performance is usually in order of magnitude uh, 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 lower than with import mode. That's the main downside and biggest limitation of direct query is usually very slow performance, especially when we deal with huge amounts of data. And that's where Direct Lake jumps in and try to overcome those shortcomings from both import mode and Direct Lake. So uh, again, we don't import any data into Power BI. So all DAX queries are being just propagated downstream to your delta tables in, in lake house or warehouse and brought on demand. But this time with performance, which is very close to import mode, there are certain techniques that are being used in the background to prepare these files to be the same as you use import mode. If you don't have, and it's out of the scope of DP600 to know these, these details, but keep in mind that direct lake is something that you will be extensively tested on DP600, and it's important to know which shortcomings this new storage mode resolves. Direct Lake is great, but it also comes with uh, a whole set of limitations. Uh, so I will list some of them here. SQL views are not supported. They will cause falling back to direct query. No DAX calculated columns, no composite model. So make sure to always check the list of current limitations. Link is included here on this slide because things are changing. So this list was way, way longer a few months ago this list of limitations, Microsoft is solving one by one. And maybe in a few months, or if you watch recording of this session, I don't know, in June 2025, you'll, you will think like, this guy doesn't have idea what he's talking about. But yeah, this is a list of limitations as of today. But that's why I include this uh, disclaimer, always check the list of current limitations because things are changing rapidly in fabric world. There are also some external tools that uh, you need to know to be able to pass DP600 exam. So it's not just about Microsoft Fabric. Remember, I told you this is a very broad exam. So it also covers external tools that are re relevant for Power BI work. Uh, DAX Studio is the first one which uh, we use to write our DAX queries, to performance, to, to tune the performance of our DAX queries. Read the query, read query plans, both logical and physical, and capture different metrics behind query DAX query executions like server timings, uh, spent time spent in formula engine and storage engine. Tabular editor is another one. Uh, you will not be tested on the paid version of tabular editor, which is tabular editor three. There is also a free version tabul tabular editor two, and that is the one which is covered by the exam. Uh, tabular editor, unlike DAX Studio, uh, lets you focus more on data modeling tasks. So you can change different properties on your tabular object model. You can define, uh, you can work with some features that don't exist in Power BI Desktop. 
like object level security or create custom KPIs. So things like that, create measuring bulks, uh, implement best practice analyzer rules and so on and so on. There are many things that tabular editor can do for you. Next concept is concept of composite models. Uh, we are talking about composite models when uh, Power BI semantic model combines data from two or more direct query sources or combine data from one or more direct query sources and import mode. Uh, in composite models world, uh, all imported data is considered as one data source. So you see here at the bottom, I have uh, data coming from Excel file and I, I have data coming from, uh, let's say, SQL Server database. All of this data, which is imported into Power BI, is considered as one data source. And uh, the main reason, uh, the, the main downside of using composite models is having limited relationships. There are many considerations and limitations about using limited relationships. Uh, again out of the scope of this session but that's the main reason and main downside uh, for not using or trying to avoid composite models you should use them only when pure import mode is not an option uh, for direct lake you cannot use them we listed uh, uh, composite models limitation as one of the limitations in direct lake when you use composite models set dimension table storage mode to dual keep that in mind this one will uh, 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 cause your uh, queries to always use regular relationships instead of limited relationships. Identify appropriate refresh rate for those tables that are uh, uh, in import mode and yeah, stick with general recommendations for optimizing direct query scenarios. Next concept is called aggregations. Uh, there are two types of aggregations in Power BI, user defined and automatic. Automatic we are not talking about them today and they are not included in the exam. So we are talking about user defined aggregations. The main idea is to reduce the amount of data uh, that the engine needs to scan uh, for retrieving uh, uh, data during query time. But the main prerequisite is to make Power BI aware of aggregated tables. So there is this option called manage aggregations. Uh, the main prerequisite is that your original detailed table must be direct query storage mode. If you don't use direct query storage mode for detailed table, you can't use aggregations at all. This manage aggregations will be grayed out, so you can't use aggregations. So original table must be in direct query. Dimension table should be set to dual because of composite model uh, uh, benefits. And aggregated tables, if possible, should be in import mode. They can also be in direct query, but uh, uh, it's better if they're they are in import mode. The next concept that is covered in the exam is role level security. So role level security in a nutshell represents a possibility to limit access to specific attributes to a certain group of users. Uh, when I say specific attributes, that can be a country, that can be a product category, uh, location. So whichever attribute exists in your data model, you can use this attribute to limit the access to specific users or group of users. There are two types of role level security in uh, Power BI, static and dynamic. In DP600, you will not be tested on static uh, role level security because it's very basic. So I think it's tested in PL300, the one uh, which is relevant for, for Power BI uh, data analysts. Dynamic one is more complicated to, uh, to implement, but uh, it requires less maintenance and it's reusable. So that's why it's, uh, uh, why it's a recommended way of uh, controlling things in enterprise environments. And then we have the opposite concept of role level security is called object level security. Uh, with object level security, you can uh, limit access to a certain column, certain table. Uh, so the entire table can be can be uh, uh, restricted from uh, from users, also specific columns and all measures that dependent to, that, that are dependent on that column will also be uh, omitted from a data model. The main difference between role level security and object level security. With role level security, you are just 
not displaying certain attributes to your end users who have who, who belong to certain role. But those uh, those objects still exist in your data model. So they are here, but they are just hidden because all your queries are just wrapped with where clause with additional where clause to apply role level security. With object level security, when you when you when you uh, uh, restrict the access to a certain column or a table, it's completely omitted from your data model. So it's not even part of your data model anymore. And as I already mentioned, object level security as of today can be defined only with external tools. Usually with tabular editor, I think you can also do it with from SQL Server Management Studio, but yeah, tabular editor is is better choice. Some other additional concepts and features to learn. Uh, DAX, of course, you can't uh, sneak without knowing DAX. Some of the concepts and functions, specific functions in DAX that you need to know, I listed them here. Regular Power BI stuff like calculation groups, field parameters, dynamic format strings that are also included in this exam, and how to uh, uh, leverage those two external tools, DAX Studio and Tabular Editor 2, for performance tuning and how to implement incremental refresh policies in Power BI. Okay, the third big topic that we are going to uh, 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 cover today is explore and analyze data. And this one covers uh, implementing exploratory analytics with different tools within Microsoft Fabric. So let's start with PySpark. Uh, this is the one that you will probably uh, uh, being, be, test, uh, be tested on DP600 exam uh, using describe method on the data frame object. So this one, when you use it like this, DF is abbreviation for a data frame. So when you use describe method, you will get following five, uh, five calculations this, uh, uh, applied for you and you get the basic information about your data frame object. So those five calculations are included. Also for grouping, uh, grouping and aggregating the data, group by, this is similar to, to SQL, and uh, ag, this is for aggregating data. In this example, I'm grouping uh, 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 my data by gender, and then I calculate the average uh, uh, edge and uh, sum of salary for those those records that are listed in this in this data frame. Ex how to apply exploratory analytics with Power Query? Uh, there are built-in features within Power Query under View tab. Uh, those three options: column distribution, column profiling, and column quality. So column quality, uh, this is the one uh, here under number five will provide the numbers of valid error and empty records in a specific column. Then column distribution will show you the number of distinct and unique values. If you wonder what is the difference, and I think it might be important for, for the exam, distinct is uh, how many distinct values you have uh, in your column, and unique shows how many of those distinct values appears only once. So distinct value can be, for example, uh, 1.5, but then you have 100 times 1.5, but that's one distinct value. But if you have 1.6 uh, appearing just once in your column, that's distinct value and that's also unique value. That's that's the difference. And column profile, which shows you a value distribution within the column and column statistics, very useful. Uh, keep in mind where you can find all of these all of these features. How do you query data by using SQL? Of course, we're not we're not going to talk uh, uh, and learn how to write SQL by, but from analytics perspective and from DP600 perspective, most of the questions will relate to window functions in SQL. So window functions in SQL, uh, I like to think about those functions as looking through the window. So I define my window where I can look for, to, through and this is basically within a table, this is a set of rows. Set of rows represents a window. And then over this window, I, I can perform different calculations. So over clause 
in your SQL statement defines the window. So what is in the window? Then partition by this is the optional uh, parameter which breaks the rows into smaller sets. Let's say that I define a window uh, for uh, uh, I don't know uh, for uh, uh, last 30 days of of something. And then with this this within this window, I can partition this data by product, by customer, or whatever. I don't have to. It's not mandatory, but I can if I need. And finally, order by close, which is sometimes required, sometimes not, depending on the function, window function that you're going to use. After window functions, the next uh, the next group of functions that are being tested on DP600 are ranking functions. So the three main ranking functions that you must know are row number. So this one simply generates row number starting from one. So no matter if you have uh, two records with the, with the same uh, exactly the same order date, exactly same customer ID, it's just the different sales order ID. It will just assign the next number in this uh, in this sequence. Then we have a rank uh, function uh, for this same example. Let's say that I have uh, uh, two orders by uh, uh, three orders uh, done by performed by the same customer. Two of them came on the same date, 24th of October 2013. With row number, it's just six, seven, and next one takes eight. With rank, those two are treated equally with rank. So both of them are ranked as number six. And then the next one, because we had two rows with same ranking number, six, the next one skips the next value, which is seven, and assigns value eight. And finally, we have dense rank, which is similar to rank, but in this case, instead of skipping the next value, it assigns the next value. So it's not six, six, eight, it's now six, six, and then seven. That's dense rank. Learn this, you will need it for, for DP600. We also have another group of functions which are called offset functions, which help you navigate through different, uh, uh, different rows uh, within the group uh, or within the window of data. So in this case with lag function, we are retrieving the uh, the record from the previous row, value from the previous row. With lead function, it's the opposite. So we are assigning the value from the next row. And first value, last value is uh, simply uh, what is the first value in this group of, of uh, specific uh, uh, what is the first value in this specific group? In my example here, I'm grouping data by customer. So the first value for sales order ID is this one. And then if I use first value function, it will repeat it everywhere within this group and so on and so on. Other concepts and features to learn here in this part, prescriptive and predictive analytics, this is very important from PySpark perspective. So within the notebooks, there are certain functions that you need to, to learn uh, for uh, uh, for applying prescriptive and predictive analytics. Classic T-SQL, group by, having, and so on. And also querying XML endpoint using Tag Studio. So this is also something that you have to know. We are slowly approaching towards the end of the session. I know we covered a lot and you're probably your brain is melting now after all these things, but that's how the exam is. Sorry about that. So some learning resources. If you are a fan of blogs, I prepared uh, three blogs that I consider a valuable resource for preparing DP600 exam. And I will shamelessly promote my own uh, data minus Mozart.com. But I really think that uh, there are some, some uh, uh, a lot of articles that covers a lot of topics for DP600. Then uh, serverless SQL by my friend Andy Cutler, uh, especially topics related to warehousing. Uh, 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 Andy covers that to great depth. So this is great learning resources in general, not just for DP600. Also another friend, Kevin Chant, he has a great blog uh, full of learning resources for DP600, and he's also mostly focusing on CI/CD stuff, but also includes other topics that are relevant for DP600. If you're a fan of videos, we'll need them. That will present for your user group in September. 
uh, Learn Microsoft Fabric, fantastic resource. He covered, I think, everything that is relevant for DP600. It's free, so uh, uh, I encourage you to go there and, and check his YouTube channel.